Hello, Last Orders listeners. We've got a very special announcement for you before we get into this week's episode. We're going to be doing our very first live show. Yes, me, Chris, and some very special to-be-announced guests will be recording a live edition of this podcast at the Battle of Ideas Festival in Westminster on Saturday the 28th of October. To those who don't know, the Battle of Ideas is a brilliant festival packed with dozens of fascinating debates and panels with world-renowned speakers, all organised by the Academy of Ideas. Me and Chris and Spikes in general are regulars there and we really can't recommend it enough. So to come along to our podcast and to enjoy an unrivaled program of discussions on top of that, go to battleofideas.org.uk to get your ticket. You can get a day ticket for the Saturday or one for the whole weekend. And there are various offers and concessions available. Our pod will be at 2.45pm in the council room in Church House, which is the beautiful Westminster venue for the festival. We can't wait to see you there. Once again, that's battleofideas.org.uk to get your tickets. Now, without further ado, let's get on with the show. Welcome to Last Orders, the Spike podcast all about freedom and the nanny state. In this episode, we discuss the clash between liberalism and transgenderism, Ted Cruz's stand against booze guidelines, and Ursula von der Leyen's war on wolves. Hello and welcome to Last Orders. I'm Tom Slater, editor of Spiked, joined as I am in every episode by Chris Snowden from the Institute of Economic Affairs. Hello, Chris. Hello, Tom. Hot out there, isn't it? Whew, what a scorcher. Very hot indeed. Look forward to getting out there later on today. But before that, I'm delighted to join to the podcast for his first time, Mark Glenn Denning. Mark is a colleague of Chris's over at the IEA, where he's the head of cultural affairs. And most pertinently for today's discussion, he's the author of a new report called Transgender Ideology, A New Threat to Liberal Values. Hello, Mark. Hello. Hi. So, Mark, let's start with you to talk about your report, um, because I think it makes a really interesting contribution to the, the whole debate that we're constantly having around gender ideology, transgenderism, in that you go beyond the kind of day-to-day battles and debates that we have about women's spaces, sex-based rights, and so on, through to what you see as the kind of more the, the kind of broader philosophical picture, I guess. You in your report you make this case that transgender ideology is, is essentially a threat and attack on liberal values of free society itself, to the extent that it's possible. Could you could you put in a nutshell what you see that challenge, that threat as being? Well, I think it's it's twofold. There's an immediate political problem, clearly, for you know, people who are broadly politically liberal. Um, in that the trans ideologists um, are seeking to suppress freedom of expression, any kind of intellectual challenge. You know, we have MPs like Nadia Whittam from the Labour Party, Alicia Kearns from the Conservatives, saying this shouldn't even be debated at all. And Theresa May is also supporting, you know, plans to make it illegal to have a private conversation with a person who's thinking of uh, going down the road of medical surgery to try and gain the appearance of being a member of the opposite sex. And if you are to do, if you do anything other than affirming their inclination to go down this uh, horrific path, uh, this will become a criminal offence. I mean, this government is thinking of passing that into law, uh, and Keir Starmer has recently confirmed that is what is going to happen if he becomes prime minister. So that's the immediate problem. I see a broader uh, problem, which is essentially epistemological, um, in that trans ideology is attempting to create a firewall between our minds and objective reality. It's trying to delegitimize established ways of knowing and believing as a precursor to giving the political class and the people who go along with this ideology and allied belief systems like critical race theory, to give them the license to completely restructure society through theory. So it has a very postmodern quality to it. And that is a, a longer term threat 
um, that if we lose this battle to maintain freedom of speech, uh, the right to express rationally based beliefs, then in fact what we're going to see is a whole range of other types of viewpoint uh, made illegal to express in this country. And I think one point that you articulate in the report really well is something that we've been talking about at Spy for a while, which is the extent to which this is a movement that is obsessed with recognition. So it's often lumped in with things like the gay rights movement, for instance, which I think does make any sense because that was very much a kind of case of getting the state, getting the moral majority out of your lives, out of your bedroom. It was very much a kind of had an element of leave us alone, fuck you even. That was the kind of approach. What we've got with transgender ideology seems to be very different. There seems to be a demand being put on the states, but also on individuals, even in their own minds, to recognise their own subjective view of themselves, what it is they are, for that to be reflected in official documentation and everything. That's not only just a difference, but I think it seems, from what you've been saying, to be that's a core part of the problem here. Could you say a bit more about that? Why is that desire for recognition, validation, such a problem from the perspective of people who are interested in liberal values, objectivity, and so on? Well, it involves, first of all... um a return to a kind of primitivism, a tribal primitivism, whereby uh, people's identities as part of some sort of group, some aspect of themselves, even if it is something that's completely imagined, as in this case uh, with, with transgenderism, this then becomes made something that is sort of sacred, And that for somebody not to acknowledge it, uh, somebody to take it on and challenge it overtly, becomes a violation of that person's self. So there's a a profoundly mystical and primitivist uh, quality to this, which is obviously very dangerous in in a, a liberal society. But the the other reason they are obsessed by enforcing public recognition of um, people's um, acquired uh, gender stroke sex identity is that they believe, you know, going back to people, say, like Judith Butler, that unless you can force the whole society to accept this new reality, um, then in fact, people cannot actually transition into this new reality. So again, it's very postmodern. It's because they don't believe there's a fundamental objective truth. They believe that all conceptions of truth are politically manufactured. And so everything then becomes a zero-sum game between rival ideologies. And that's why they have no respect for free speech, or they don't believe in free speech, um, because they don't accept that you can have a kind of spontaneous cultural order in which we just agree to disagree, and we go our own way. So trans people can assert whatever they want to about themselves. They can express their inner truth. But equally, you and I can say, I, you know, with all due respect, I'm afraid I don't buy it. That is not acceptable to them. To them. So there's a profoundly fascistic uh, quality um, to all of this. It's very, very totalitarian. So even private speech has to be regulated, as we're seeing with this demand from both Labour and Conservative politicians, that private conversations should become something that could land you in jail. And it just strikes me as being quite Orwellian. You know, a lot of things get described as Orwellian, but the you know, corruption of, of language and truth is you know, at the heart of 1984. Um, the reason Jordan Peterson got into this in the first place, as I recall, was that not that he had any issue with trans people per se, just that the Canadian government was forcing people to re- refer to uh, people in a certain way. And, you know, if you identified as a woman, if you've been born a man, the law, I, as I understand it in Canada, was saying, or the proposed law, I don't know if it went through, it uh, was saying that it would be illegal to refer to that person as a, as a man. And, um, I, you know, Peterson's got a bit crazy since then, but I think he was actually bang on with, um, with that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's 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 worrying for the, all the reasons Marx explained and then he explains in his his report um, that you've got people trying to create 
and force upon you this alternative reality and potentially use the force of law to to try and do that so yeah obviously that is is pretty scary and and mark on the point of where this is going i guess um because there's always a temptation to look for for tipping points but one of the things that you say in the report is that recently there have been some interesting developments um there's been obviously the collapse of the gender self id bill in scotland sent large part taking down nicola sturgeon in no small part i should say um you've also had things like baroness faulkner at the um equality and human rights commission who is pretty firm on these issues has been advising the government to firm up the protections based around biological sex um there's been of course the gender critical feminists who have gone from being kind of incredibly demonized to being accepted figures in polite society and discussion to a certain degree at least um do you think that there's a kind of element that because this ideology is so at odds with how most people see the world also because it's so contradictory it's one thing that you say in the report it kind of believes that gender and identity is constructed by all these forces around you yet at the same time it's an inner essence doesn't really stack up it feels like a worldview which is is brittle in the sense that it's very hard but it can crack very easily as soon as it's subjected to public discussion so are you hopeful for where things are headed if that's not too glib a question i'm afraid i'm i'm well i'm confused i mean i think you're absolutely right that there are encouraging signs of a fight back uh intellectually uh within the culture but the trouble as we saw in scotland is that the political and uh, corporate and bureaucratic forces that have become completely possessed by this ideology i mean especially the you know police we've seen this extraordinary incident in hebden bridge where a woman has been visited by the cops because she took a photograph of a feminist sticker that had been placed on top of a trans sticker and they came round to warn her that she'd been seen on CCTV or reported by somebody and that if she was to then um, pass this on, this would then, uh, her photograph, this would be then a hate crime. So the trouble we have is that all the major institutions in our society have become possessed by this ideology. So the current government I just read today is thinking of allowing children to change their gender and have this recognized within schools. Now, this has huge implications for teachers. I mean, what are teachers going to be going back to Chris's point about Jordan Peterson and mandated speech? Are teachers going to be sacked, disciplined, potentially even prosecuted once Labour come to power if they refuse to go along with this within the school environment. I mean, we've seen children either expelled or disciplined for refusing to go along with this. I mean, I don't know about you, but I used to be sent to the headmistress or the headmaster <laughs> for, you know, being caught, I don't know, smoking or something in break time. I mean, it also opens, of course, the door up to, and I know this sounds all a bit, you know, Daily Mail and Richard Littlejohn, but it does, of course, open up the door to new forms of identity, and which could then in future become protected characteristics in law if you apply the Equality Act to them. So, you know, we've got now the furry movement. Um, I mean, where, where does this end? If I suddenly redefine myself as a 12-year-old girl, is this, does this have to be, you know, recognized in law and by others? Can I just, just mention teachers, which remind me there, on a slightly... Uh, Slightly later note, but same same uh, topic. Have you been keeping up with the Kayla Lemieux saga? Are you familiar with this this person? Have you not seen this one? I, I I've missed the latest. I was away last week, so I missed the latest iteration. But this is the Canadian school teacher who wears these ridiculously oversized prosthetic breasts, seemingly, although it's never he's never admitted this as a kind of fetish, really. But would wear this to work. There was obviously a lot of concern from parents and so on. The school have stuck by him very firmly as. Uh, seemingly for wanting to be seen on the right side of trans rights and history and so on. But um, what was the latest, Chris? Are they just continuing to let him walk around with these things on or what? Well, the, the term time began. He's a primary school teacher. I mean, if you, listeners, if, you, if you're not familiar with this case, do Google Kayla Lemieux um, because... Not his real name, we should probably stress, but... Um, or not his, not his born name or whatever. <laughs> Ke- Kerry Lemieux. Actually, Lemieux is, is, is his real name. It's, it's changed from Ke- Kerry to Kayla. Um, to say the breasts are large is an understatement. I mean, they are like something from this. I mean, they are infeasibly <laughs> large, completely unrealistic, like comedy norks. 
And um, there was a suspicion among some people, including myself, that this guy was this, the world's greatest troll. And he was taking advantage of you know Canada going insane in the last few years to um, to make make the whole thing look stupid, you know. And I think that seems to have been borne out because um, the term time started. The police were getting ready for protests. I thought there was going to be trouble from parents and so on. And this dude just turned up, not wearing normal men's clothes, a bit overweight, quite a bit of stubble like nothing had ever, ever happened. And I don't think he's ever commented to anyone about it either. So this is part of the genius of this prank, if indeed it is a prank. But um, it looks like for whatever reason, it's it's all died down. And this guy's made his point and moved on. Or he could have just you know transitioned back. But personally, I think he's just an awesome troll. Well, I suppose he's a sort of Canadian version of Eddie Izzard without the enormous breasts, because Eddie Izzard, I think, claims part of the week to be a woman. And then part of the week, he says he's a man. This gentleman in Canada, if he's not doing this as a sort of exaggerated Titania McGrath type, you know, um, joke stroke political point, it, it might be that he's more in the Izzardian, uh, you know, category of trans activist. You could believe that if it wasn't for the enormous breasts. I mean, that's, to me, the giveaway. Um, it, like I say, you, you, they have to be seen to be believed. But I don't. I, I, I just spent a lot of time looking at these. <laughs> they're, they're so funny that the whole thing has to be a joke. It has to be. Well, can only hope. I mean, it'd be a genius prank if it was just to explode the whole idea of self-identification. There'd be. There's no better way of doing it. Um, Chris, shall we move on to some of the um, nanny state stories that you picked out this week? The first one, um, you very helpfully in the email you sent over just provided a link to Ted Cruz saying that if Washington want him to only drink two beers, they can stick it out their ass or something. But there's more to this story. Is this official guidelines, which Ted is um, objecting to? What's been going on in America? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it was Ted Cruz, who's, who's kind of a... I don't really follow American politics as much as some of the nerds over here do. He's, he strikes me as quite a risible kind of character, quite a sad character. Because didn't he get behind Trump? He got on the Trump train, didn't he, eventually in 2016, did, despite but... Trump saying that his dad killed Kennedy. And, and that his wife was ugly. He just said that. Yeah. <laughs> your wife's dark. Your wife's dark. Um, so, but yeah, so he's kind of a pitiful character. And he was doing one of these rather sad, I guess, campaign ads in some, I think in some factory with a bunch of blue collar guys all holding a beer. And he was saying something along, well, we'll play the clip, but it was along the lines of, you can kiss my ass if you think I'm only going to drink two beers a week. And now these idiots have come out and said, drink two beers a week. That's their guideline. Well, I've got to tell you, if they want us to drink two beers a week, frankly, they can kiss my ass. Um, this tweet, like so many tweets these days, has got a community note under it saying that nobody is actually saying that Americans can be limited to two beers a week. But the, the kernel of truth in this is that the Canadians... We may have mentioned this before, I honestly can't remember. Um, the Canadian government is on the brink of saying that that should be the, the weekly guideline, the weekly recommendation, no more than two beers a week. Um, and, you know, we saw our guidelines go down a few years ago for no good reason. They've been going down everywhere, really. It's the same group of people who are kind of feeding in the so-called science into this, say, oh, the science has suddenly changed dramatically. Because, I mean, previously it was like two or three uh, drinks a day in Canada. And apparently the science has changed so dramatically in like six years. It's now going to be two a week. Um, it's all it's all going in the direction of zero. I mean, that's the ultimate aim. You know, this is why you get so many people fervently denying that moderate drinking has health benefits, um, that there's no safe level of alcohol. It's just they want to go down tobacco roads, you know, usual thing, tobacco, anti-tobacco playbook. Um, I was just I was just reading today that there's some class action lawsuit again in Canada. We should do a whole episode about Canada sometime. It seems like all the funniest, worst stuff comes out of there. There's some class action lawsuit being filed by I think she's a woman in her fifties who has breast cancer, and she's saying that she stopped drinking, you know, when she was younger, and no one told her alcohol causes breast cancer, and so they're suing the bats, you know, for this again, just straight out of the anti-smoking playbook. Um, so yeah, that's that's really all, all to say about that. Just um, yeah, Ted Cruz, Cruz got a little bit carried away there. Um, but the Americans are looking at changing their drinking guidelines. They do it every few years. God knows why. The science never actually changes very much, to be honest. And if anything, these guidelines should be going up if they were following the science. And I believe that we're also 
going to well we're on the subject of, of alcohol we should we should check in, in in scotland with minimum pricing which is a story that obviously you've been tracking for a very long time since they introduced it and it does seem like no matter what the evidence is they still proclaim it to be a success but what is the latest evidence where this is concerned and what are the scottish how have the scottish government been spinning it chris uh, well what we had last monday were two bits of news on the same day about minimum pricing. Firstly, that the UK Statistics Authority had written to the Scottish government saying that this press release you put out in June saying that minimum pricing has been a wonderful success uh, is not really a fair reflection of your official evaluation. So the official evaluation of um, minimum pricing conducted by Public Health Scotland, actually a very good piece of work, very thorough, 40 different studies in there, about eight of them pertain specifically to health, and um, all but one of those studies could, found really essentially no evidence whatsoever for any benefit, no benefit in terms of A&E attendances or um, uh, road traffic accidents, heavy drinking, underage drinking, all sorts of criteria, all of which were obviously supposed to get better when minimum pricing came in, and they couldn't find any evidence that they had improved. And then indeed, they found some evidence of harm and unintended consequences. Um, with the exception of one study, which we've discussed before, uh, it's a modelling study, essentially. They, they took a counterfactual of what Scotland what might have looked like, you know, what alcohol-related deaths in Scotland might have been in the absence of minimum pricing or what they actually were. And even though they went up massively and they're currently at a 14-year high, which was the second bit of news that came out last Monday, um, they said, oh, it's still lower than, lower than it would have been. And, of course, it's quite difficult to argue against something like that because it's entirely... You know, theoretical. It's exactly the same as you get with a sugar tax. You know, child obesity goes through the roof, then they say, well, it would have gone even further through the roof had it not been for the sugar tax. And um, so that's kind of where these people are stuck now, you know. And if you think about how long we spent um, arguing about this, there's the national debate about the sugar tax, Jamie Oliver, all this banging on and on, hysteria about the number of children who are obese. Sugar tax is absolutely essential. And then child obesity just keeps on going up afterwards, and they go, well, it would have been even worse. Minimum pricing was supposed to be virtually a silver bullet, you know, the way people went on about it. Uh, Alcohol-related deaths, you know, go go again through the roof, and they say, well, it would have been, you know, look, to, to, to be absolutely fair to these people, the pandemic did have an effect on obesity and on uh, on heavy drinking, right? So it does make... It more difficult to evaluate these things, not so much the sugar tax, because you had a couple of years of obesity rising before um, the pandemic hit, but particularly with minimum pricing. Um, so yeah, it's harder to, to evaluate, but we have got this you know, larger evaluation, like I say, 40 different studies, and the Scottish government just cherry-picked this one, all the public health people cherry-picked this one, and the UK Statistics Authority, good on them, wrapped them over the knuckles for it, and they actually had to change the press release they deleted an entire paragraph in which he said disproves that um you know minimum pricing has, has been affected so look i guess we will never know for sure whether minimum pricing has had any positive effect i would just say to public health campaigners you know for the next thing that you're campaigning about whatever it may be alcohol advertising bans and what have you rather than go on about you know the the number of people who are currently obese, a number of people who currently die from alcohol-related deaths, and, and acting as if this policy was going to do something, you know, reverse that trend. Just say, well, you know, if you introduce this, things will still get worse, but maybe not as, more, not as rapidly as um, they would have done otherwise. If they'd have said that back then, even the Scottish government wouldn't have introduced it, I don't think. Right? These governments introduce these things, which have a big cost, Hundreds of millions of pounds minimum pricing has cost Scottish consumers. Um, they do them because they expect to see a notable downturn in the problem that is supposed to be addressed. And Mark, unless you've got anything on the the booze story, should we move on to Wolves, which is a much more comical sort of setup? I don't know if you've been following the story as closely as we have, Mark, but um, this is becoming a core beat of this podcast. Yes, I, I, what got me into the story was um, uh, the sort of rather amusing tale, I mean, tragic, of course, at the same time, um, of the, you know, president of the European Commission who'd been in favor of, you know, releasing uh, wild animals and, you know, increasing the wolf population until it, um, until one of them, you know, killed her beloved pet pony. Um, well, when the wolf was literally at her door. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, probably not her dog because I mean, she's got a big kind of estate, but a you stable, know, stable dog paddock, uh, at her, her paddock. Um, but it seems to me there's something sort of very weird going on here, which I would be interested to know what the two of you, if, if you think there's some sort of connection or, you know, contradiction, that a lot of the people, you know, vaguely in the centre of the political spectrum, centre-left, stretching right out to the kind of extinction rebellion crazies, are all, you know, mad for rewilding. I mean, George Monbiot and these people, they have some sort of Tory romantic love of you know, the wild and um, they all, you know, blame the industrial revolution for climate change and what have you. So they tend to be the sort of people who are saying, oh, we must release more dangerous animals into the uh, into the environment. But then at one and the same time, they tend to be the kind of people like, you know, the European Commission who want to regulate us, you know, in terms of what we can drink and eat and now what we can say in private to trans people and so they're fanatically obsessed by health and safety you know in one context but then in another context they kind of have this romantic vision um of you know making the european environment more wild i don't know is what's going on here that is a very funny contradiction it's kind of um slapping your hand away from the cookie jar of one moment and then releasing ravenous wild animals into the <laughs> population the next it's a very strange state of affairs but as, as Mark was saying there Chris there, there has been developments on this front we've been talking about this this strange campaign in the UK to reintroduce wolves and various other apex predators it has kind of already happened in parts of the continent but it seems like partly because of the fate that befell poor Ursula von der Leyen's pony um, they're, they're starting to reassess whether their the EU Commission Habitats Directive I, I believe should be revised so that it would be easier to get rid of these animals now they're seemingly posing a threat um not just to livestock but to humans we should say do you want to tell us a bit more about the latest with this and what you think about it yeah i mean i think i think i could be wrong i think the eu only made wolves a protected species last year and now because and it, let's face it, it is because the european commission present uh, pony eaten, um they're looking to start culling them and they, they probably will. It, by the way, if, if anybody uh, needs some help calling them, I would be very happily volunteer. If the government wants to give me a cool rifle or even a machine gun, send me out and hunt, hunt down wolves in the hills of, of Germany or anywhere else, I will <laughs> gladly do that. I'm not scared of them, you know, uh, especially if I've got, well, only if I've got a gun. Um, where was I? Yes, yes. So, so um, yeah, now they're talking about a coal. Um, if you look at wolf numbers in Germany, and probably anywhere where they've got a virtually unlimited amount of food, they just go up and up and up and up, uh, and they will do. And they're not eating deer as Monbio hopes they will. If you recall from our last episode with Simon Evans, we were talking about how apparently there's too many deer knocking around in the, in the countryside and wolves will take care of them. Well, they, they, they haven't been hunting deer so much as sheep and ponies, which are easier to catch. And if they've got... Uh, in effect, unlimited amount of food, then their numbers obviously are going to keep increasing. And eventually, you need a predator to go after the wolves, um, which, as I say, I'm happy to volunteer for. So unless unless there's any more on wolves, should we move to our, our post-bag question sent in by our, our listeners? Post-bag, post-bag, post-bag. Um... It's bulging, eh? Mark, if we haven't told you about this, this is where people who listen to the show can pose questions to to yourselves um we've got one here from um matt brugazzi sorry if i'm not pronouncing that correctly could chris please say a few words about brew dog i saw him debating with someone on twitter about how craft how the craft beer fad is over and i enjoy his brew dog takedown so chris could you rehearse one of those takedowns for us here right now um what was i talking about i think it was some story in the guardian saying that um a lot of the so-called craft breweries are struggling and I think there was an implication that this was Brexit, and I don't think it is Brexit. Um, I think they're struggling to sell beer to the people in this country as well, because I think it's a fad that's over and done. I know a lot of people listening to this will disagree. And look, it's only an opinion. It makes the world go around. I'm not saying it should be banned or anything. I just said I personally think it's horrible stuff. Um, sort of grubby little metallic tasting alco pops for millennials, really. Massively overpriced. And people have finally seen through it and therefore they're not buying um, this disgusting American influenced rubbish anymore. And I hope they will continue to um, 
avoid it. I don't like BrewDog in particular because BrewDog supports in minimum pricing. Um, I think they got me too as well. There's some people at BrewDog. There's definitely as I some recall. scandals. You know, a, a toxic, a toxic work. Even if it's not, even if it's not kind of sexual stuff, it's something's gone on there. I seem to remember toxic culture. Yeah, because they do present um, themselves as very kind of worthy. I think they even made a Barnard's Castle beer during uh, lockdown. Oh, did they? Oh, how how very funny. Yeah, which was, and they gave it to Keir uh, Starmer. It was, uh, yeah, that's what lions, yeah. uh, was it? Lions led by donkeys drink. Exactly. They look, they're the it exact is, same people. It is. It? So, I mean, so I, I dislike them on, on various levels. You can see, um, look, if you want to drink it, fine, drink it. I introduced it to the, my snooker club because I knew people, you know, once wanted it, it's fine. Um, but personally, I think it is the work of the devil and people should drink. Very mercy. And Mark, unless you've got very strong feelings about Brewdog, there's a there's another question here which um is more on the sort of question of of culture and values, the sort of things that you you talk and write about a lot. Um, but with a bit of a geopolitical spin. So this um question here from Twitter saying, Is Putin right that Western society is terminally decadent? And of course, people might have noticed that in recent years, Vladimir Putin has taken to trying to latch on, I think, to the kind of Anglo-American culture war to suggest that we've all completely lost our minds to very opportunistically kind of position himself, I would say, as, as the source of um, font of common sense and tradition and has actually been won over by some of America's more credulous conservatives, I think, in this particular endeavour. But Mark, what do you make of, of that, how the, the culture war's kind of gone global in that sense? Well, of course, there's a huge irony in somebody like Putin um, uh, trashing um, aspects of Western uh, culture or sort of emerging, you know, ideological forms when, of course, he's another authoritarian. So what he's essentially lambasting, rightly, is the way in which, um, you know, reason, logic um, are being uh, delegitimized in the West. But, of course, he's from you know, another type of politically authoritarian tradition, which equally doesn't believe in the right of, you know, the Russian people to uh, challenge him uh, and contest ideas openly. So he, he's another sort of strain of, of authoritarian anti-liberalism. Um, and so that's obviously a, a strain that is well established and more traditional within the you know, the Russian uh, East European sphere, what we are experiencing is the emergence of a new sort of counter-enlightenment um, within our world, which was until, you know, let us say 25, 30 years ago, uh, predicated on broadly politically, if not economically, uh, liberal values. And that is what is now under threat within our uh, society. So, in fact, I, as a liberal, I see Mr. Putin having quite a lot in common with the, you know, the people who want to ban uh, trans conversion therapy, as they would call it. I mean, they're all different manifestations of authoritarianism, which want to guide society towards predetermined outcomes that they happen to like subjectively. And, you know, the rest of us can go hang, whether we're in Russia or in uh, Britain or America or wherever we happen to be. Do you remember when Putin started going on about J.K. Rowling? Do you remember that press conference? That was very, that was very funny, wasn't it? He, who do you think, Mark? He's trying to appeal to with this kind of stuff. Is he, is he just trying to appeal to people in his own country, or is he trying to appeal to, you know, middle-aged men in America who think that Putin's quite based? I mean, it's a very interesting question as to you know why he 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 got involved in. Uh, that that issue. I mean, I suspect that within the Russian world, as within you know other places as well, that in addition to the liberal reservations about uh, transgender ideology, there is obviously also a small c conservative um, objection to it, uh, and so it. So actually, his intervention is incredibly unhelpful from our perspective because he's not opposing trans ideology from a you know liberal um, 
point of view. He's he's just opposing trans people, basically. He just doesn't want to, for, you know, for his own reasons, to see people um, claiming they are of a, a different sex to the to the one they were born with. Definitely, that was a that was a real curveball question, Mark. So I appreciate you dealing with it so so well. Another final curveball for you is at the end of this show, um, we ask our guests, given that this is a very liberal to libertarian kind of show we're against banning things generally on on principle it's getting less and less like that isn't it to be honest you know having a go <laughs> at brew dog like banning wolves it's about yeah exactly <laughs> having a it's become more exactly we're shooting wolves and we're clamping down on those bully xls all sorts but um if, <laughs> if you could have one ban mark um what would it be and it, it's got to be something that's really petty it can't be something worthy it can't be banning hunger or uh, sadness what yeah. would you ban um, oh well, I have one. Uh, uh, you know, very easily, um, very easy to come up with. Um, I, I would ban the wearing of um, what I call, probably in a very dated way, knapsacks. What are they called now? Backpacks, rucksacks. Yes, backpacks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're younger and more trendy, obviously, Chris. They've been called that for quite. A <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> just you get on the tube, and there are people with enormous. Mm you know, things on their back. And you're thinking, what, what are you going hiking in, you know, the mountains <laughs> or something? And, yeah, you know, they, they're getting off at Canada Water. They're, you know, they're working in the city or something. They're suited and they've got these enormous things on their back, you know, bump into you. And sort of grumpy gammons like me get uh, get very angry about that. And also then I hate the the other end of the continuum on that. So you don't then see... Um, particularly young women, not so much young men, wearing tiny ones that are the size of a sort of postage stamp, uh, for obviously for some sort of fashionista reason. Well, that's all right. What's the problem with that? I can understand why you hate backpacks. They are annoying. And people who wear them, particularly on the tube, they don't seem to realize how much room they're taking up and, and move their body accordingly. But if you've got a tiny little one on your back, that's surely a, a victimless crime, isn't it? No, but I, I, I'm against it aesthetically. There's something annoying. Okay, good. Well, that's that's the kind of petty thing we're after. <laughs> Just people, well, very- people carrying, like, I mean, mine, mine is having the, um, you know, the, wheel, the wheelie bags, the wheelie suitcases, you know. So we're just against anyone carrying luggage in London, aren't we? Absolutely. Yeah. It is strike the wheelie suitcases. Ever since you've mentioned it, I see it everywhere. And you think these people are not going away. I'd, like on holiday or something, they just seem to, it just seems to be a part of life. I don't know. You can have a good time if you're ever, you know, um, at Victoria Station waiting for a train. Just get near the um, ticket barriers and just sit, sit there watching how many people with these big uh, wheelie suitcases get them caught behind them. They put the ticket in, they get halfway through, the thing closes, and they're just stuck there waiting for someone to bail them out. And people, if you're behind someone like that, do not bail them out. Just leave them there. I think we've got a wheelie, uh, you know, wheelie crisis in this society now. To add to all our other crises, I think something needs to be done. Yeah. You're right, and only only on this podcast are we taking it seriously. Brilliant, Mark, Chris, thank you both very much. Thank you, thank you. You've been listening to Last Orders. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Please do take a moment to leave us a rating and a review. And if you'd like to support the show, why not become a Spiked supporter? Just go to spikes-online.com slash supporters to sign up. That's spikes-online.com slash supporters.